Welcome to the Vision Mission. We have another great episode today. We have with us Emily and Patty. Patty, this is your second <laughs> podcast, so you're basically an expert. But oh, yeah. Emily, this is your <laughs> first my first. Time, right? We're happy to we're happy to have you both here. Yeah, thanks. So, um, if you first want to introduce yourselves, tell us your position, and then a little bit about what you do for your position. Okay. Um. So I am a TBI, teacher of the visually impaired, and I work on the early intervention program team. Um, I also do functional vision evaluations for CCBI. Um, Yeah, I mean, I go into people's homes uh, for kids who are blind, visually impaired, and I work with their families, um, help with resources, just learning how to live life with a child who is visually impaired. So that's kind of what I do. And then the functional vision part, uh, we get referrals from all over. And so I will be a lot of times the first contact uh, for somebody with a visual impairment and, and learning how their functional vision works. So that's what I do. Cool. Such an important profession. <laughs> so um, I'm an orientation mobility specialist and um, I work with, I have students both here at CCBI and uh, itinerant students um, that I'm seeing and they have you know, all age ranges. Um, you know, an orientation mobility specialist teaches kids uh, to orient themselves in their environment, you know, uh, where they are, you know, to know where they are in their environment, and then how to, the mobility piece is how to get from point A to point B Mm -hmm. safely and efficiently, so. Cool. Okay. Two pretty important jobs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Maybe a little. Um, (laughs) But, so, why did you guys want to work in, like, the field of vision? Like, what inspired you, got you started? What Mm -hmm. what was that like? Well, I can go. Um, so when I, I went to KU for my undergrad, mm-hmm. and this is somewhere that they tour every year. So I got to tour this place before I even thought about working here. Oh. Um, I loved it. And it just so happens that a couple of years later when I graduated, like right when I graduated, we got an email saying, hey, Children's Center for the Visually Impaired is hiring for a teacher. I was very interested. So I uh, applied, got the job, and then I kind of just fell in love with the population, and mm-hmm. the rest is history. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? So yeah. was your, did you go to KU? Was your degree in, like, special education? Yeah, it was like in uh, early childhood special education. Oh, so it was okay. kind of a perfect fit because mm-hmm. that is who we serve is the early childhood population. And then I knew that I, I didn't specifically want to work in public school, just not my jam. And so I was looking for some, you know, specialty or something to really go into um, that wasn't, you know, just general special education. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it just like was perfect. It was divine intervention. It just happened, you know, so it was really cool. Yeah. And Emily, I especially love it because a lot of times um, when people enter the vision team profession, it's mo- it's mainly because they have a connection with yeah. you know a family member yeah. or, or somebody mm-hmm. in the community that they already know and that kind of guided them here. So yeah, it, well, we, thank we, you. We need more TVIs and <laughs> yeah, so it we just need kind more of people just to like have this you know yeah. uh, desire to work mm-hmm. with the visually impaired. Yeah, not only because well, they you. know somebody who is uh, visually for sure impaired, just so. interested and love the population. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And Patty, how did how did you get into your field? Yeah. I mean, you're an O and M. That's very very specific to the vision field, Absolutely. but yeah. what, what kind of got you to take those steps? To become yeah, an so in 2005, my daughter was born. Um, she was born with labor's congenital amaurosis, and it's a rare genetic disease. Mm-hmm. Um, by four months old, we had a diagnosis that, you know, with labor's congenital amaurosis, and that she was severely blind. Um, never had any experience with anybody in the community previous to that that was blind or visually impaired, so um, quite shocking and, and just wondering where was that awareness like how mm-hmm. did I miss you know yeah. being around people that were visually impaired in my community yeah um but so it started off with Mary Rose and I mean uh, my husband and you know our family just had this quest for knowledge of you know how are we all going to raise this child with a visual impairment you know mm-hmm. even my mom was reaching out to uh, Chicago Lighthouse for the Blind different organizations and resources um it, it ended up guiding me and my husband to starting two parent organizations for families of children with visual impairments. Super cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, then, you know, years down the road, Mary Rose started at a school, uh, Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And then I got involved with, you know, helping her out, uh, volunteering in the literacy program, uh, also in the program, um, the theater program they had. And so I would be backstage with other 
you know, mm -hmm. friends of Mary, peers mm -hmm. of Mary Rose's that, you know, have all different types of visual impairments and, you know, different levels of vision that like some had usable vision, some had no vision at all. Mm -hmm. And um, because I was so involved, I wanted to do better. I wanted to be the best person back there helping them and mm -hmm. doing the right thing. And uh, I think that's when I heard about uh, the different programs. Uh, online to become an orientation ability specialist. Mm -hmm. So I went to TTU and did that. And it, it actually even led into um, me helping form a new parent organization at TSBVI called awesome. Family Links. So very cool. Uh, yeah. yeah but, and then, you know, just recently came here to CCBI mm -hmm. and I love just it. pinching myself that I'm here. Yeah, I'm, glad <laughs> you're here. I'm glad that you're here. You've been a great addition. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just had the White Cane Safety Day celebration. That so definitely cool. could not have happened without you and your energy. That was yeah, awesome. Yeah, that was the coolest. Was really I'm very excited to see that, see it progress like yeah. in the future. And I mean, I will Super be right cool. there advocating yeah. for another one because it was a lot of fun seeing so, yeah, oh, the families right. come out. Super cool. Like that. Mm -hmm. But um, that kind of like brings up the point of like awareness. You're saying like, where was that awareness? Like mm -hmm. whenever your daughter was born and everything mm -hmm. like that. And October is Blindness Awareness Month. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like it's maybe not, personally, I feel like it's not as well known mm -mm. and everything. There's a lot of other things that people you know, celebrate awareness for, I mean, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I think it's Mental Health yeah. Awareness Month. Like, there's, there's yeah, a lot of things. There's a lot yeah. of things in My October. Feed, yeah, it comes up with a lot of things, but blindness is not really one towards the top and yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, I kind of want to talk about, like, the importance of that awareness and blindness awareness. And specifically, you know, CCBI, we work with, um, here at our facility, early childhood education. Mm -hmm. You know, we have like our little littles, littles, and then we'll do older kids. But what is the importance of early childhood education for kids with special needs? You know, oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, so our kids, um, because of a visual impairment, they they need uh, extra support mm -hmm. with um, a lot of their the different skills that they need to build in order to um, meet this this gap because of the visual impairment. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, there's a, a, uh, it's called expanded core curriculum mm -hmm, and yeah. uh, there's these nine areas where our kids need extra support mm -hmm. to meet these needs and so um, the earlier we start the better I mean early intervention for kids um, with visual impairments is starting when they're a baby mm -hmm. uh, you know getting in there they're playing uh, it's called active learning and you are there beside them helping them, supporting them, interacting with toys, and they're actually, uh, you know, you're teaching them alongside them as they, they play and learn. And so yeah. Um, just, yeah, we need to start early with kids. Uh, yeah, that early exposure is really important. That's something I also think about is that early exposure to a lot of the academic concepts and ideas, mm -hmm. like, you know, calendar time, like mm -hmm. doing those types of things early where they're you know maybe not developmentally they're quite there but they've been exposed to it now mm -hmm. so by the time that they are it's not something that's a brand new idea a brand new concept they've mm -hmm. had experiences with it I also feel like um, this is a really important place to start educating parents on an educational setting for their child mm -hmm. um, because once they leave here they will you know a lot of them will be on an IEP mm -hmm. and so that first IEP that transition from us to a school district can be hard and confusing and a lot of people don't have experience with it mm -hmm. so I think an important thing that we do not not just for the kids which it is for the kids but for the parents too is to help guide them in an educational way an educational setting on you know how to advocate and how to you know go about writing an IEP and the rest of the school yeah, you know school definitely. years that kids will be in and I'll tell you from uh, my experience as a parent mm -hmm. that um, before that first IEP meeting, I heard from other parents about how stressful it is and come prepared. And yeah, I just feel like for our parents here at CCBI, how blessed they are that, you know, we have this team that's supporting them. It's it's not a scary thing. Mm -hmm. It's you don't have to do this by yourself. You yeah. have a team, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so that and then, sure. and then parents starting with that advocacy, like role modeling advocacy for their children so that eventually the kids take it over and take start advocating yeah. for themselves. Exactly. You know? Become it's, more independent, yep. having those skills under their for belt. Sure. They know what mm -hmm. to do. They can be their own person. Yeah, it starts yeah. with the parents, you mm -hmm. know, and then they, they role model it for the kids. Yep. So that's definitely where I it sounds like awareness starts is with the parents. You know, if the parents are more aware, yeah. they have those skills and resources more importantly, like whether it be at CCBI or beyond that, 
and they can take away down to the toes and it kids can be better supported for sure and everything exactly and so you had brought up the expanded core curriculum which mm-hmm. kind of like leads into like my next question okay. like yeah. the different ways that we teach our kids here at ccdi mm-hmm. of course you know what is it 85 percent of everything you learn before, before the age of three t- is yep. through vision so you yeah. know if that's impaired or completely taken away like mm-hmm. things are going to be taught a little different it's going to yeah. be a little harder to learn you know your abcs when you can't necessarily like see the board or mm-hmm. follow along the book and everything so yeah i kind of wanted to go in talk about like those specific ways like emily you say you do fbes and mm-hmm. your your tbi and you're out in like the school community. districts and yeah. homes and everything like that so for sure teaching like you know parents or just kids in general like what does that look like for our kids for our kids i think you know a lot of what we do and, and i don't think we even think about it mm-hmm. when we do it now it's I'm like sure. of course but like taking a more multi multimodal approach to things so Absolutely. you know how do we adapt things so that you can see it smell it taste mm-hmm. it touch it you know doing all of those things and embedding them into yes. our curriculums and addressing those parts of the ecc um i think we do a really really good job of that and we don't even oh, realize absolutely. it because mm-hmm. our classrooms are built for that mm-hmm. and that's another thing is that you know everything in our classrooms are adapted for kids with visual impairments we have you know things to modify and accommodate and they're just so readily available to us mm-hmm. so yes. i think that that you know and then even going out in the homes if i need something i can come to the school and check it out and like try it at home mm-hmm. you know and then if it works out great let's get one something you know that's that's a really important piece of what we do and how we you know teach families and kids for sure mm-hmm. one of the differences that i find really unique and exciting about ccdi is that there's almost this reverse inclusion mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. um you know our students you know you know come here with visual impairments but we also bring in students that are typical kids that mm-hmm. that you know and so the the students with visual impairments outnumber those that yeah. are coming in with typical you know Which is pretty cool um, it is mm-hmm. typical gro- growing and um but what I like too is that you know there's that still that peer role model yeah. right that's mm-hmm. you know that social interaction piece that they're gaining from this peer that's here that's you know maybe you know doesn't need as much help on the social skills mm-hmm. definitely yeah I feel like that relationship is really good too especially for our kids who are visually impaired when they transition out yes. Yes. into the public school yeah. district you know they for sure maybe already have some friends or peers who are completely sighted and mm-hmm. then you know reverse for the peers you know like they transition out to the public school but they they know what a white screen is yeah they now know. they have the experience yeah and the, the knowledge about and just think the awareness as they go uh-huh. up that they'll even create yeah you know, because of their experience here the comfortability yeah. that's exactly. a big one being comfortable around people who are different oh, than yes. you mm-hmm. and i think that's huge yes i think i think that definitely is like one of those things that should start young you yeah. know i mean if you're used to seeing wheelchairs yeah. walkers white canes whatever it may be like mm-hmm. when you're older it's not such like a yeah well yeah know? it's not like, a shock yeah. it's like what is that like you may have an idea but you remember preschool yeah or like elementary or whatever it may be and yep. everything so yeah. and then emma what about like just at ccdi that we have you know all of our therapists mm-hmm. and vision specialists mm-hmm. right here working together you know we might be in the office and have a you know yeah. A, a little collaboration happening on the side that we didn't all plan, the time you know all the time a very natural environment for collaboration for our students meeting their needs and, and like and i think that it's really important to note that our therapists are very knowledgeable about oh vision. absolutely and you oh don't gosh. necessarily get that in you know a public setting where they're serving kids of all kinds of disabilities not just yeah. visual impairments mm-hmm. um and of course our kids have other disabilities as well additional but I mean, the the knowledge that our therapists have about vision is so important and it's such a needed thing in mm-hmm. this, you know, in this environment. And I think that's a really, like, it's really important and really cool. Yeah, It, it really is. And I then mean, when mm-hmm. our kids trans- transition into the public school, then our therapy, our yeah. speech language, you know, OT, PT are sharing all these things with mm-hmm. their, yeah. you know, therapists as well. It's it great. is. Yeah. I, that's one thing I've noticed about CCDI is that everyone here is like, just super super intelligent and just knows <laughs> a lot like in their field i'm like physical therapy but for blind and visually impaired yeah. children like such speech and language it's such a it yeah. really is but i think that's like super powerful especially for those parents it's like oh, you have your sure. back from maybe like from day one here we yeah, are from day one from an <laughs> slp but also from you know yeah. all these other things uh, the, the general community probably doesn't realize that mm-hmm. not every child has access to this in their community yeah. mm-hmm. so 
um, when Mary Rose was younger and she was in uh, preschool kindergarten, we were in Minnesota and we did not mm -hmm. um, have this type of setting for, for Mary Rose. Mm -hmm. we, um, we needed uh, resources um, to make sure that like experts to tell us that we were doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so we literally traveled out here to have an evaluation for Mary Rose from Minnesota because we knew the specialists were here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. And we well, love that you guys came all the way like down here, but are hoping, you know, uh, that it becomes, everybody. yeah, it's in every state, every county, mm -hmm. every region, like that those services can yeah, be accessible. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. and, you know, we kind of like, we're talking about like our team here at CCBI specifically and how all of our roles like collaborate and overlap. But I kind of want to talk about as a CBI and as an LM, how your guys' roles overlap and how you collaborate with certain yeah. students and all students, really. Well, as a TBI, I'm not able to do her job. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're two separate vision providers and we mm -hmm. do two separate things. Um, but we do collaborate on a lot of things. Like um, as a TBI, a lot of the concepts and ideas that an O&M provides for a student or teaches a student, I am backing those up in the classroom or mm -hmm. I'm backing those up in the community and I am uh, supporting those ideas and concepts. Um, I'm, you know, as a TBI, you help implement that student using a cane wherever they go, no mm -hmm. matter what setting. And O&M, you know, a lot of times they have a specific set time where they, you know, today we're going to cross the street. We're going to get, you work know, we're going to work on these skills. Mm -hmm. And then as the TBI, since you see the student maybe more, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily in an itinerant setting, but you're able to carry over a lot of those skills and mm -hmm. kind of just support what they've been teaching the student. And the follow through, you know, for those goals. And that you can maybe even encourage the other staff to, yeah. you know, the paras or the aides that are working. Yep. If you're having more involvement, like to, to help with that follow through is yeah. really great. So. For sure. I love that. Um, I love that you guys do collaborate so much because obviously mm -hmm. that's going to benefit the kid. For sure. You know, if you guys are yeah. all on the same page, mm -hmm. yeah. the kid is going to excel beyond the limits and everything like that. Yeah. Like and, and there's like the, the body concepts and uh -huh. directional mm -hmm. positional concepts that we all can work on with the students. Yeah, that overlap, especially those younger years. Mm -hmm. It definitely overlaps yep. more. Yes, those younger years mm -hmm. are super duper important. And I feel like you know, parents they're learning all these things, and they're I'm sure telling their family or their friends because I mean, mm -hmm. parents want to talk about their kids. Course. I mean, <laughs> anything course. new or interesting, you want to talk about it, even mm -hmm. if it's like your cousin or nephew or something like that. You're like, you're probably gonna want to talk about it. Yeah. And so like that right there is just advocacy in itself. Yeah. But maybe for someone listening who maybe doesn't have like a direct relationship with a child or an adult who has a visual impairment like what what kind of advice would you give or maybe even tips would be a better word for it to people who want to advocate but they just like don't know how like what would you tell people you can advocate for the blind and visually impaired community by doing x y and z mm -hmm. or something like that what what immediately comes to mind well what immediately comes to right. my mind is, yeah, is creating opportunities for people with visual impairments to showcase their talents Absolutely. and show that they are capable and it's it could be providing oppor a work opportunity mm -hmm. for them if mm. you you know have a business you know welcoming you know people with visual impairments to, to come and work and um, they're capable just like anybody else is. Yeah, so, that's a good one. Um, I like that. Yeah, just advocating that way. Definitely, yeah, that's a good one. for sure. That's very like tangible too. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, you know, small business owners, you know. Yeah, I mean, might mm -hmm. as well. Like if someone who's visually impaired comes in, like. Do your job. Yeah. Yeah. See where they can help make you. It, exactly. Make it, make it happen. Provide an opportunity. And then, like, even, you know, like, there's uh, musicians out there mm -hmm. that, you know, are, have disabilities. So, mm -hmm. yeah, not even just visual impairment, but look to the community. Is there a way to hire a musician with a disability uh -huh. if you have an mm -hmm. event? Right? Yes. So, That's great. That's a good one. That is a good yes, one. I, like I do too. That's a good one. That creates awareness to like all those people that come to the event. Right? It really yeah. does, you know. Touches a lot of people. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. yeah. Maybe even those who a direct relationship it's like oh wow they're doing that mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. my kid can do it any someone who maybe doesn't it's just like oh wow that's cool they're up there with their cane you know yeah. maybe whatever the impairment or disability is it's still kind of just impressive and inspiring i think to the general public mm -hmm. so i really like that a lot yeah. too. Emily, do you have any others to draw off um of? you know i think about just creating environments that are accessible as in you know like universal design um, mm -hmm. those types of things for people who are in wheelchairs mm -hmm. or people who use a cane, making sure that our, 
our streets are accessible for walking. I think yes. I walk down my sidewalk all the time and oh, I think yeah. mm-hmm. I think about my sidewalk and I'm like, oh, that, you know, that limb, they would definitely get hit in the face uh-huh. or all these cracks and, and lumps in the sidewalk from the tree roots. Like mm-hmm. I think about those types of things. And if we could just, uh, you know, advocate a little bit more for universal design and making sure that those types of public spaces are accessible for people, mm-hmm. yeah. that would that would really I mean, it'd be so helpful. It would be so helpful for the community that, you know, is is different than you mm-hmm. although it everyone can access it yeah know, so definitely do you think uh and this is kind of like just a question a side note do mm-hmm. you think like that community access and like having just accessibility for wheelchairs canes whatever it may be in the community do you think that kind of like inspires and motivates one visitor in the community to get out more and to like do empowers for them, sure right? okay. they're able to do it yeah exactly mm-hmm. i mean i'm sure you can speak a lot to that because mm-hmm. of mary rose but like you know, I think about myself and I think, OK, like an idea or, you know, something that I think about is like, I hate going to the grocery store when it's really, really busy. It's mm-hmm. not accessible for me, mm-hmm. like pushing around a car. Yeah. You yeah. know, if that is something that is a barrier for me, then I can imagine thinking about somewhere you have to, you know, walk upstairs and you have a wheelchair or, yeah. you know, it's just not accessible. And I don't even want to do it. You know, I don't mm-hmm. even want to try. I don't even want to go. I get my groceries yeah. delivered. Like, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I literally hate, I mean, that's not the best, uh, you know, comparison. But if you think that's about still. it, like, yeah, it's just like, if that's a barrier for me, mm-hmm. like something that simple, mm-hmm. you know, then I'm sure there are way bigger barriers and, and, and things that are keeping people from really experiencing a lot of life. Yeah. So, I, yeah, yeah, experiencing point. a lot yeah. of life. Yeah. I could. I like that. Yeah. Yep. I like that, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it really is like those those small things. Just yeah. like I mean, you really know, think about it like, oh my gosh, this is so inconvenient for me. Exactly. The inconvenience not... of doing some mm-hmm. of those things for me. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, it's still accessible for me, but I still don't want to do it yeah, because exactly. it's inconvenient. And I feel like you, you don't know? really think about that like yeah. it's inconvenient for me. It's like, oh wait, what if I think about somebody else who literally yeah, yeah it's way more inconvenient for them. So uh, I love the way you say experience life because yeah. if you're visually mm-hmm. impaired, a lot of times you need those experiences to understand yeah. Yeah. You the know? world. Yeah. yeah so definitely. Um, so yeah, I guess that kind of like brings up a good point, like pet peeves. I just, I always, like, <laughs> I always am just so curious in general, like in general, like what people's pet peeves, I, I yeah. some of them are kind of goofy. Some of them are like, yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. But in our industry, in our field, like what are your guys' biggest pet peeves? I can, I can see smiling. I know. do. We I already know. About we did. We're like, there's so many. What do we say? <laughs> um, for me, I think it's assuming incompetence. So, you know, as someone who works in this field and someone who works with these people every day, our general rule of thumb is to assume competence, assume mm-hmm. that people can do it, assume yes. that they do know, assume that they have something to say. And I think a lot of the general population assumes incompetence when it comes mm-hmm. to somebody yeah. who's blind or visually impaired, like, you know, something that they can't do or, you know, it's sometimes it's not accessible, but just that idea mm-hmm. of they're able to do less. Yep. I think that is a big like that comes first misconception. Before. Yeah. And then yeah. we were even saying, you know, just even sometimes, you know, there's a, a caregiver uh, with a mm. person that's visually impaired. And how many times do people talk to the caregiver instead of the oh person gosh, with yeah. visual mm-hmm. impairment? Uh-huh. So I have to say that that's the one for that's me is one. like, that's... you know, talk to the person with the visual mm-hmm. impairment. If you're asking them, uh, you want to know their name or what they're doing or what kind of day they're having. Um, you're Maybe. not going to talk to the caregiver. You're going to talk to the, yeah, person, the person with the visual impairment. So, yeah, um, and then, one. you know, if you run into uh, an adult or you see an adult with a visual impairment out in the community and they are actively using their hands and their cane to find something, it's okay. Let them do that. They, yeah. are, they are being independent, looking for something. You can always say, would you like some help? But you would never just say, oh, the bathroom's right here. Or, you know, mm-hmm. you you want to give them the opportunities to be independent. Yeah, that's Definitely. a good one. I feel like, yeah, seeing someone with a cane or a disability in general, like, I feel like people's thoughts go one of two ways. One, like, oh, I need to help them. Like, mm-hmm. it's almost like your social responsibility. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is, oh, I, I, I don't know, like, maybe they can. So you almost, like, avoid it. Avoid like, it. Oh, yeah. Like it's either maybe, one or the other. Yeah, yeah. and it's not always yeah. the time like being disrespectful it's mm-hmm. just like you don't know and I yeah. feel like that again goes back to awareness like the more you know the more people are probably willing to get involved for and, sure like, and to ask yeah. and, and you don't like want to take that 
you know, empowerment away from them mm-hmm. of like taking, you know, yeah. by just going in and telling them where something is when they, exactly. they're, they're doing what they need to do to find yeah. it themselves. Right? Yeah. And we had talked too in the, the last podcast about, you know, with your children, parents, it's okay in your house if your child's walking around and if they are going the wrong direction, they just might need a little more time to realize and to problem solve that mm-hmm. they're going in the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. So give them that opportunity to, you know, uh, advocate for themselves and ask for help if it's not you yeah. see there's some frustration building then you might say oh mm-hmm. yeah did you need to ask me something you, yeah yeah now but just you know for minimally, sure so. I see that a lot in the home mm-hmm. and it's obviously I work with you know birth to three mostly Little so else. people parents family mm-hmm. they they do stuff for their kids all the time except you know we're trying to get in that mind frame of letting them do what they can do, Mm -hmm. you know, easily and letting them fail and letting them, you know, trial and error and problem solve even at that age, Mm -hmm. because it starts at that age. It starts the independence and the, you know, the want to do things and motivation, you know, is huge at that age. Motivation to do things. And if someone's always doing something for you, then you don't have much motivation to do it for yourself. Yeah. So it kind of starts at that young age for sure. That's a good tip. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I mean, and general you know you need to let your kids fail I mean if you're talking about like little kids like you need to let them fail you need to let them figure out like oh that hurt I shouldn't do that whether they're blind or not right yeah exactly Exactly. (laughs) yep for sure yeah I like that and I like that perspective definitely that you guys both are offering to your families and your students Mm -hmm. like no matter the age it definitely starts young but as being like older you know like it's still good to have Mm -hmm. someone in your corner but it's still good to figure it out on your own yeah and be able to ask questions absolutely and so has there been, in your time working at CCBI, I guess we'll just narrow it down to that. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Has there been a time working at CCBI that has really, like, changed your way of thinking? Mm, we talked about this, too. We're <laughs> like, what is it? Right. Um, I think for me, I don't know if there was a very specific time because I was thinking about it. I was like, okay, like, honestly, my mind has been changed the entire time. Like, mm-hmm. through the entire time that I've been here. Yeah. You know, uh, my way of thinking has changed due to you know, different family situations or, uh, you know, more education and professional development and learning new things because I feel like the the field of vision is constantly changing. Absolutely. There's a ton of research into cortical visual impairment. You know, it's oh, just yeah, forever cool. changing. Mm-hmm. So in my mind, I, I've started somewhere, but like constantly evolving, constantly yeah. evolving you know, I, I couldn't come up with like a very specific time, but mm-hmm. that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's, you know, I'm, just started at CCBI in August, and I feel like my brain is a sponge uh, working <laughs> with you know, all these therapists and other vision team specialists. And uh, every day I'm learning, you know, learning how to help my kids even more. So yeah. it's just it's really wonderful. I think that probably comes from overlap and like the collaboration mm-hmm. again, you know, but sure. you, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's true. Yeah. Well, I love, I love that you guys are yeah, with sponges, wanting to interact mm-hmm. oh, with for others, sure. wanting to learn more. I mean, something not in your field could still apply to your field. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Again, what well, you don't know, you don't know. Mm-hmm. And if you learn something new, you're like, huh, I wonder how I could apply that. Yeah. So, but, yep. um, Emma, well, have you ever thought about being an O&M? Yeah. Oh my gosh, right? <laughs> no, sometimes I do. Like, whenever I, come down, class, whenever I come down to, like, a classroom join and, like, team. see it in the hall, I'm just like, that would be kind <laughs> of I mean, you're already part of the CCBI team, but join the vision team. I know, right? yeah. Honestly, You'd I, be so I good at it. it. I know. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know. Maybe, maybe down the road, if I like really want to spice up my life, or yeah, something. just do a little something extra. Mm-hmm. I know, like something extra because I like love documenting it mm-hmm. and everything because I feel like that's where like my role is. is yeah, like, like literally this podcast in general, which I is mean, also very important for mm-hmm. education and yeah. reaching communities. Definitely, it's huge. But, it's huge. But yeah, but then I think too. I'm like, oh, what if I was, I was on the other side? If I was a TV, I don't know, like. I would yeah. have like the insider insider. The yeah. I wouldn't just you be like would. repeating what I heard. I'd actually like no. I'd actually like this that's is what true. I learned. You have learned so much. Yeah, I just, feel like it. yeah. We're but talking for sure. But like I like it though because like I don't. Re- I didn't really have anyone specifically like who was visually impaired or yeah, blind like me motivating me to go into this field. It just like the opportunity arose. I was like, yeah, okay, cool. yeah. And now I'm just like, and oh, then here we are. Is- Look at us. I know. And now I think like down the road, I'm like, I don't know what I what else I'd want to do. I'm like, this is like really the cool. Same. Yeah. Like I'm like. But, you know, that I think that's fine. I think, you know, staying put for a while, but, like, you know, going out and, like, yeah. you love this field. Maybe it wasn't what you originally planned on doing. But yeah. now that you're in it, we're all really you're in really it. Really in yeah. it. Yeah, you buy it for Which sure. Which I think is great. And I think the buy-in points are awesome. Like, whatever it may be. You see a little kid, you know, yep. across the street. And you're yes. like, 
Every day is oh a gosh. every day is a different day here, especially. I mean, like, the oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah, you never know what you're walking into. Yeah. And I love it. I love it. I that love is it. true. Even from the admin, we're like, oh, everyone's laughing. And so, yeah, so it's today. really <laughs> sad today. It's a Tuesday. I get it. I want to cry too. Yeah, yeah. But I do. I, yep. But yeah, I like that. Yeah, but um. Yeah, well, oh my gosh, thank you guys for joining yeah. me. Yeah, this is fun. I this love this. It was a good conversation. It was straight to the point, you know. Yeah. Advocacy. Love Awareness. It. Mm-hmm. Starts when you're young. Starts with parents. Um, but yeah. But, I mean, is there any other things you want to point out or talk about or say, like, right before before we end it that the world should know, parents yeah. should know? I think, you know, just social media has been uh-huh. a great way to get awareness out there. And, you know, that's what you're helping mm-hmm. us with, too. And so, you know, share, share yeah. anything you see that the uh, – you know, is, is positive about the community of visual impairments. Because... Yeah. yeah. And I also think that it's okay to ask questions. The mm-hmm. other day we were at the park and I was with a little girl in her own M and her OT. And another kid was so curious about her cane, mm-hmm. was so curious. And so we went over and talked to the kid about it. But I think for parents with kids who are curious, like it's okay to approach somebody mm-hmm. and ask questions and educate yourself in mm-hmm. a, you know, in a, a nice manner and from the curiosity standpoint. And I think that is a lot of how education can be spread. And mm-hmm. just knowing that it's okay to ask questions. Mm-hmm. It's okay to educate yourself. All of the above. And I think in, in your uh, children's public schools, asking them to do inclusion yeah. events in oh, the yeah. public schools Huge. for the whole school mm-hmm. to learn about all the disabilities. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. I like sure. that. Yeah, for sure. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you guys well, for joining me today. This has been thank super you. Just fun. And powerful. So, <laughs> so fun. Thank right. you. And everyone tuning in, thank you for tuning in. I hope you take something away from this. <laughs>